A very good morning and a warm welcome to the morning session of the second day of the webinar. To chair this session, we have two very eminent scientists, Dr. Jackson James and Dr. Nidhu Mohan. Dr. Jackson James is a senior scientist and associate dean at the Rajiv Gandhi Center for Biotechnology, Trivandrum. He has an exemplary track record as a researcher in the domain of neurostem cell biology. As a postdoctoral research associate at the Lead Transplant Center of the University of Nebraska Medical Center, USA, Dr. Jackson received advanced training in the area of neural stem cell and transplant biology. He is a recipient of many important awards, including the National Bioscience Award 2016 of the Department of Biotechnology, Government of India, and the DSG Young Scientist Award. He is a member of many important committees, including the Neuroscience Task Force of the Department of Biotechnology. He has about 50 research publications, many of them in extremely prestigious journals. It's a pleasure to invite Dr. Jackson James to chair this morning's session. Dr. Jackson James, sir, please. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Shrikumar, for inviting us uh, to chair the sessions. And, uh, I think uh, you'll be introducing Dr. my co-chairman, Dr. Nidhu, too, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Dr. Nidhu Mohan is a scientist in the Division of Cellular and Molecular Cardiology of the Sri Chitra Chittirunal Institute for Medical Sciences and Technology, Trivandrum. She has a keen interest in cardiovascular biology and currently focuses on cardiac connections and their regulation during myocardial fight process. Her group also focuses on factors that impair the function of cardiac progenitor cells in a setting of cardiac injury. She had her postdoctoral training at the University of Kansas, USA, and has worked in Japan as well. Dr. Nidhu Mohan has 20 publications in international journals and two international patents who are credit. It's our pleasure to invite Dr. Nidhu Mohan to chair this morning session with Dr. Jackson James. Dr. Nidhu Mohan, ma'am, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I thank the organizers for inviting both of us to uh, chair this wonderful conference. Uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Jackson. Maybe you can uh, proceed. Yeah. Yeah. Introducing thank the you, speakers. Dr. And uh, I think we will, uh, uh, in the interest of time, <laughs> I think we and our speakers are all the way around the globe, uh, the other side, uh, yeah. uh, waiting to get a good sleep too. So we will just go ahead. And we have a wonderful section today, starting from uh, five five talks today. And the first talk would be by Dr. Randy T. Cowling from University of California, San Diego. Uh, Dr. Randy T. Cowling obtained his PhD from University of Ottawa, Canada. And his dissertation was on neutrophil cell physiology. He then moved to San, to San Diego, California for a postdoc position in the Department of Medicine at uh, UC San Diego under mentorship of Dr. Barry Greenberg and uh, Wolfgang. His research focused on physiology of cardiac fibroblasts with an interest in how his, this applied to post-myocardial remodeling. He continued at uh, UCSD as a project scientist, eventually accepting a position as an assistant professor. His current research interests include fibroblast physiology as it pertains to collagen metabolism and AAV mediated gene therapy for heart disease. That's very interesting. He is funded by the U.S. National Institute of Health and Department of Defense. So today he is going to talk on the topic strategies in cardiovascular disease management, lessons from the past and what the future holds. So welcome, Dr. Randy, and uh, welcome to this uh, session and uh, over to you. Thank you, Dr. James. Uh, can everyone hear me? Absolutely. <clears throat> yes. Great. Um, I again, I, I I appreciate greatly. I, I'm good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. <laughs> As you can see, it's about eight o'clock our time, so it's dark out. But eight o'clock is still fairly early in the evening, so we'll be okay. Um, I greatly appreciate um, your kindness and in inviting me to speak. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen. Let's see if this works. All right, so um, I was invited to, to give a short talk about applications of biotechnology in cardiovascular disease uh, management. Um, there's certainly been many advances in the cardiovascular field in terms of pharmacology and medical devices, 
Uh, but given the explosion of gene therapy in the US, Europe, and in China in the last few years, I thought that I'd focus on that. As with many technologies, they tend to get hyped when they're first identified, and gene therapy has certainly been through its shares of ups and downs. But as we all know, science doesn't travel in a linear trajectory, and progress can be slow and uneven as we navigate our understanding of the complex mix of the chemical reactions that we call life. In this talk, I want to briefly go over the history uh, and controversies of gene therapy in general, and then focus the presentation on cardiovascular disease, ending with the current status of the field and future hurdles that uh, must be overcome. I just have a little picture. This uh, it actually is a beach in a city that's uh, just a little north of here, still in San Diego County, but in a city called Carlsbad. Uh, and pasted in this little heart here that's in obvious need of assistance. And we'll see if we can uh, do something uh, with gene therapy to help it out. So gene therapy, in terms of the US Food and Drug Administration, uh, involved in products that mediate their effects by transcription and or translation of transferred genetic material and or by integrating into the host genome and are administered as nucleic acids, viruses, or genetically engineered microorganisms. Uh, in terms of the European Medicines Agency definition, uh, it contained recombinant nucleic acid used to regulate, repair, replace, add, or delete a genetic sequence in humans. Its therapeutic, prophylactic, or diagnostic effect relates directly to the recombinant nucleic acid sequence it contains or is the product of expression of its genetic sequence. So, I mean, I think many of us have delivered bare nucleic acid, transfected it into cultured cells. Um, in some instances, that is used in gene therapy, but overall in vivo, it's not a very efficient process. So the most common method of delivering genetic material in vivo is with replication incompetent virus because of its efficacy. There are more um, viruses that are used in gene therapy than I've listed here, but these are the three main ones. If we have adenovirus, retroviruses, which also include lentivirus, and adeno-associated virus, or AAV. And for the sake of brevity uh, and time, I, I'm not going to go into any details, but certainly all of these viruses have their pros and their cons. So in terms of gene therapy strategies, um, they, you can use the technique to completely replace a missing protein. If you have a deficient protein, such as in a haploinsufficiency situation, you can replenish or add more of the protein back to normal levels. If you have a situation with a poison peptide or a dominant negative mutation uh, in a protein, you can try to silence it with uh, RNA eye technology. Um, and then there's also, I'm really not gonna go into any of this because it's just too involved for, for this talk, but there's also a lot of interest in the CRISPR-Cas9 system uh, to edit genes, um, uh, basically changing the genetic makeup of the individual rather than exogenously adding a transgene. So in terms of the history of gene therapy, and I'm going to focus a little bit on some of the earlier stuff, as well as I mentioned earlier about the ups and downs in the field, um, some of the controversies uh, that came out of some of the earlier work. So in 1980 was the first uh, and underlined here unauthorized use of gene therapy. So uh, Martin Klein, who was, the, who was the chair of hematology at UCLA, transferred the beta globin gene into the bone marrow cells of two patients with beta thalassemia minor, and then transfused the patients with these cells without meaningful effect. There was no clinical effect. So the cells had been removed from the individuals and then transfected or then transduced, and then they had been, uh, uh, you know, reinfused back into the patients again. One of the issues, and it was unauthorized, as I mentioned, because he failed to obtain IRB um, approval through UCLA. He, he contended that because these two patients were in Europe, that IRB approval had been obtained at those institutions, but UCLA 
was adamant that it had to have been obtained at that institution as well. And ultimately, he lost his NIH funding and his department chair because of it. In 1990, now this was the first approved clinical trial using a novel retroviral vector. Bayes and Anderson transferred uh, ADA gene, adenosine deaminase, using a retroviral vector, again, into explanted cells of two patients with, uh, with bubble boy syndrome, with SCID. And then each patient received multiple Tolgus infusions with their gene-corrected T cells over two years. Now, there's no indication that there was any efficacy there because both patients remained on, on their pharmacologic medications. Um, but it was the first. Uh, unfortunately, this particular situation, um, two of the, or one of the investigators, William Anderson, you know, his contribution in the field was marred because uh, later uh, in 2006, he was convicted of child sexual abuse and sentenced to 14 years in prison in 2007. Uh, he was released on parole in 2018. Um, he's now in his 80s, and and his his time in the field is is over. But it's unfortunate that when, when most people uh, in the area think of William Anderson, you know, the idea of his conviction and prison sentence overwhelms what he had done in the field earlier. And then many people would be aware of the incident in 1999 uh, involving Jesse uh, Gelsinger at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, there were many ethical concerns involving his death. Uh, he received adenovirus-mediated uh, correction of a partial ornithine transcarbamylase uh, deficiency, OTC deficiency. This He was part of a safety study. He was the 18th person to receive a dose. He actually was a replacement subject because one of the originals had dropped out of the study. Uh, after receiving the dose, he, he died four days later after suffering a massive immune response to the vector. There was an investigation and the FDA concluded that the investigators broke several ethical rules. Um, first of all, he should have been excluded because he had recently had high blood ammonia levels. Uh, in their disclosure to the, to the uh, patients, the investigators failed to report that two prior patients had experienced serious side effects from the infusion, and they had also failed to disclose that experimental monkeys had died after receiving a similar treatment. In addition, one of the, the main study investigators, James Wilson, and the University of Pennsylvania reportedly had financial stakes in the outcomes, which everyone knows with conflicts of interest is a big no-no, especially today. So all these problems and the findings of the FDA essentially decimated the gene therapy field for almost a decade. But and researchers weren't going to give up. And actually, um, James Wilson, who I mentioned earlier, who had originally been you know, essentially vilified uh, in the uh, issues with, uh, with Jesse and uh, Gelsinger, he started to advocate for adeno-associated virus as, as a gene therapy vehicle. Um, initially, uh, AAV was identified in the 1960s, uh, initially thought to be a contaminant. Uh, in adenovirus preparations because it does need helper virus, either adenovirus or herpes simplex virus to uh, replicate. It has advantages as opposed to adenovirus, which obviously is one of the viruses that causes cold and is pathogenic. AAV is not pathogenic. Now I put an asterisk here because uh, well, as I'll show later, it does have issues, but it certainly does not have the type of immune response that uh, adenovirus shows. And it is able to transduce non-dividing cells and maintain expression over months to years. Uh, the disadvantages, it does have a fairly limited packaging transgene insert size. So if your gene is bigger than about 5 KB, you're not going to be able to package it in AAV. 
it may not be pathogenic, but people are still exposed to AAG, AAV, so neutralizing antibodies still exist in patients, and this can be a problem um, when dosing, uh, because uh, neutralizing antibodies can neutralize some of the titer of the infusion. There are challenges producing high titers that are needed for gene therapy, because it's not a an, an simple virus to produce. Uh, and it does have a single-stranded DNA genome, and this single-stranded DNA has to be converted to double-stranded DNA in the mammalian nucleus and before it can be transcribed, and that often delays protein expression by up to two weeks, which can be an issue in, in some situations. So, excuse me. So if you look at a typical translational timeline um, for uh, drug development in the U.S., and that would include gene therapy. Through the initial drug discovery, through preclinical pre development, that is when um, you can apply for investigational new drug status. If approved by the FDA, you can move into clinical development in phases one, through phases one, two, and three. If, if success is obtained there, then you can move into new drug application, an NDA. If the FDA approves, then you would move into post-marketing. And you can, as you can imagine, you can see how the numbers in each of these categories go down quite dramatically. So at the moment, there's at least 149 clinical trials in gene therapies going on in the U.S. And, but in terms of in vivo injectable AAV, FDA approved gene therapies, there are currently only three on the market. One for SMA or spinal muscular atrophy, one for retinal gene therapy, and one just recently approved in November for hemophilia B, uh, B gene therapy. And just to give you, I'm not gonna make a big deal about this, but just to give you an example of one certain drawback of these therapies, and that is the cost. When, it's, when it was initially released uh, into the market, uh, Zolgensma Gensma um, cost, its cost was about or over $2 million per treatment, which uh, is incredibly expensive, as you can imagine. I'm not going to focus too heavily on this. We're talking about gene therapy in general. In the talk, I want to, to move on to cardiovascular gene therapy. And it lagged a little behind, obviously, the other gene therapies. Uh, initially, most of them focused more on the immune cells, the hematopoietic cells. Um, but initial targeting was, was tended to be to the vasculature, um, not the heart. Uh, initially, the heart came a little later on, but let's just give you an idea of, the, of some of the early studies targeting the vasculature um, for the cardiovascular system. Specifically, now starting to look at the heart, and now we're again, there's no FDA approved gene therapy uh, for the heart at the moment, but there have been plenty of clinical trials. I'll give you an example of a couple clinical trials that were UCSD uh, was involved. Uh, this uh, is a trial that finished quite a few years ago, probably about five years ago, six years ago, Cupid 2 AVA, AAV1 circa 2A trial. This is a, a AV, AAV1 is a serotype AAV. Circa 2A is the um, one of the calcium ATPase pumps. In, in the sarcoplasmic reticulum of the cardiomyocytes necessary for calcium cycling and contraction relaxation. Um, and this was a phase 2B randomized study. I'm not going to go into all these criteria here, um, but um, suffice it to say that when you look here with these Kaplan-Meier curves, the p-values are all not significant. Conclusions were that, I'll hide that. Conclusions were that the AAV1 circuit 2A did not improve outcomes, which was disappointing, but you have to remember that at the time there hadn't been much work done with AAV gene transfer in the heart, so they did conclude that at least intracoronary gene transfer, which is how they delivered the AAV, was safe 
without notable adverse effects. And moving on to a more um, current clinical trial. So um, this is a Dannon disease. And Dannon disease uh, is a lethal X-linked disorder caused by mutations in, in LAMP2, which is lysosomal membrane-associated protein 2. It is rare, affecting no more than about 10,000 people globally. Uh, loss of LAMP2 expression severely impairs autophagic flux. Um, and the clinical presentation is profound cardiac and skeletal myopathy. Uh, these patients develop hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, so the cardiac muscle gets thicker, as shown here. You can see a thicker septum in this uh, echocardiogram, uh, which progresses to end-stage heart failure with severe fibrosis. The affected patients typically die in the third decade of life unless they receive a heart transplant. Uh, and there are currently no FDA-approved therapies for treatment of Bannon disease. This is an example here of one patient um, who suffers from uh, Dannon disease. Uh, skin fibroblasts were isolated from him and they sequenced the gene and there's a, an AT insertion in the gene, which led to a nonsense mutation, premature stop codon. Looking at the fibroblasts in culture, either with immunofluorescence or with Western blot, there was no LAMP2 expression at all. So what, and this was initiated through a, a Dr. Eric Adler uh, here at UCSD and Rocket Pharmaceuticals, um, but they developed a, this is the AAV9 genome um, with a LAMP2B um, cassette in it. So there are three isoform splice variants of LAMP, A, B, and C. It happens that the cardiomyocytes express B. They constructed this, packaged it in AAV9, tested it and verified it functional in animal models of the disease, as well as cardiomyocytes derived from a human-induced, uh, uh, these um, uh, embryo, these are, are inducible stem cells, sorry. And then a clinical trial was initiated, and this trial is still open. They're still recruiting, although they are uh, accumulating data. Um, I'm not going to go into the inclusion criteria or the primary or secondary objectives, but uh, it was announced in the September meeting this year of the uh, Heart Failure Society of America that the currently dosed um, Dan and patients uh, in this trial are showing positive results. So it's looking very good. Uh, so far, and as the study uh, continues, uh, they'll be able to continue to evaluate. So, for gene therapy for cardiovascular disease, the current consensus is that AAV serotype 9, which I mentioned for the Dannon disease, or AAVs with genetically modified capsids are best. Now, I haven't mentioned the genetic modification of the capsids, but it's an active area uh, in the pharmaceutical field. The idea here is to mutate the proteins on the surface of the AAV so that they are more selectively taken up by a particular tissue. And in this case, it would be the heart. Um, and this neutralizing antibodies, as I mentioned earlier, due to prior exposure can be a problem. This was something that was brought up in, in the CUPID-2 trial that I had mentioned. And one interesting thing is that the titers to the various serotypes of AAV tend to vary greatly between geographic regions, which uh, can complicate matters when trying to dose patients in different areas of the world. And gene therapy is best suited, obviously, for diseases involving single gene mutations, which are much rarer than for the more common cardiovascular diseases with complex etiologies. So I mentioned um, the, some of the FDA approved gene therapies, although nothing for cardiovascular disease. I mentioned um, some that are for cardiovascular disease that are in current clinical trials. So what about some of the preclinical stuff? Um, there are many of them, 
way too many to go over here. But one example that's that's occurring right now here that we're working on uh, is um, you know, funded through Lexio Therapeutics, uh, and that is looking at uh, TNNI3 cardiomyopathy. So um, TNI3 is one of the three subunits that form the troponin complex uh, of the thin filaments and striated muscle. Like if I go, I'll, I'll show you a picture of it on the next slide. Um, it is the inhibitory subunit. Uh, so it blocks actin myosin interactions and meet, thereby mediated, mediates striated muscle relaxation. Um, it could, there's three genes in the TNI family, TNNI3, TNI2, and TNI1. So three is the one that is cardiac specific. Um, there are multiple mutations that, that affect this protein or this protein and the penetrance is very variable, but mutations in TNI3 are associated with familial hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with dilated cardiomyopathy and with restricted cardiomyopathy. This is a picture here just showing, this is the, uh, this is the thin actin filament in the muscle fiber. Here's a thick myosin filament. And tro troponin I is here amongst troponin C and troponin T, that complex. And it accounts, again, troponin I mutations account for about 5% of the, um, the genetic cardiomyopathies. So I mentioned all this, um, but um, I had also mentioned early on that there are still some issues that uh, are, are need to be addressed with uh, gene therapy. We, I mentioned AAV isn't pathogenic, doesn't induce the same kind of immune response that say an adenovirus would, but there are problems with it. And these have been certainly highlighted in the last few years with the uh, explosion uh, of the use of AAV in clinical trials as well as in as authorized treatments. So I mentioned this FDA approved AAV9 based treatment for, um, for SMA. In August 2020, there were two reported deaths from acute liver failure, uh, one in Russia and one in Kazakhstan. Uh, that occurred five to six weeks post AAV infusion and one to 10 days after corticosteroid taper. This is part of the regimen for, uh, for treatment. And a little bit more troubling, this is AT132 is not approved, but it's currently in clinical trials. This is an Astalis um, Odentes AAV8 treatment for X-linked myotubular myopathy. Apparently in the trials, there have been four deaths um, to date, uh, and one recent death uh, using low dose treatment. And again, all these deaths were with uh, due to liver toxicity. And the concern about low dose treatment, um, I'll mention it a little bit later, but um, the effect on the liver is believed to occur with, with some of the high doses that are needed uh, or that are used in, in these uh, gene therapy treatments. And it was surprising that a low dose treatment also caused liver toxicity and death in one individual. It's a little concerning for the field, but we'll see how it plays out. So conclusions, AAV is the preferred gene therapy vehicle, but it is expensive, which is certainly gonna limit uh, in the future its use. I, I didn't mention this at all, but I did mention CRISPR-Cas9 uh, technology Unless something changes, some new technology arises in the field right now, AAV is not useful for CRISPR-Cas9 because this system requires a guide RNA and other um, uh, uh, parts of the vector that just can't be put into AAV. Uh, diseases with complex etiologies involving multiple factors, including genetic and environmental factors, will be difficult, if not impossible, to treat with gene therapy. The easiest to treat are the single gene mutations. And liver toxicity continues to be a, a concern. It's simple to restrict gene expression with tissue-specific promoters. So for the heart, you could use a cardiomyocyte-specific promoter, which is often done. 
but this does not reduce the viral load that, for example, the liver will see. Um, there are companies actively trying to circumvent this. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, cardiac specific capsids, so mutating the proteins on the outside of the AAV to allow them to target the cardiomyocyte more specifically. The idea is if the heart takes up the majority of the virus, there isn't much for the liver to take. Um, we'll see how that plays out. And then another one is altered dosing routes. So there's a, one company, and I can't remember off the top of my head, using a loop perfusion system to try to circulate the virus around through the heart, avoiding the liver altogether. And on that, I would like to thank you um, for kindly inviting me to talk. Uh, and I hope some of the stuff I've said has been informative. I'd also like to thank, I'd mentioned Dr. Adler, um, who's professor of medicine here. Um, I actually used some of his slides on this talk, so I'll give him a shout out for that. Uh, and in addition, and he's been instrumental in the, in the Danon work. And then my mentor, Dr. Barry Greenberg, is also a professor, a professor of medicine here. And he was majorly involved in the CUPID-2 clinical trial here at UCSD, as well as he's currently involved in, in the Danon um, phase one clinical trial also. With that, uh, I thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Randy. That was really a wonderful talk. Uh, and we do have a lot of students uh, who are listening to you. And uh, that that was really informative to students as well as all of us. So, uh, uh, is there a time for like we can take a uh, couple of questions if uh, there are? I have a question. Yeah, please. Hello, Dr. Cowling. This is uh, Hari speaking from New York. Uh, you may not know me, but uh, I was a PhD student back in 2019 with uh, Dr. K. Shivakumar. And he's organizing this meeting. And uh, you had uh, shipped out some uh, DDR2 knockout mouse slides, as yes. you may remember. And that is I very remember. Wonderful. Yeah. I'm uh, Hari Krishna. We am the lead author. Nice to meet that. you. Yes. Yeah. Nice to meet you again. I recognize Everybody. you by name. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> so, um, just one question uh, How do we tighter the dosage to be given for like different patients? Uh, when we treat them with uh, AAV, like do they differ from patient to patient, or uh, how is that? How do we determine the dosage? It's usually the... yeah. So it, it, for something like a denovirus, you can actually titer the virus based on infectious uh, units. But AAV is is a difficult virus because of the need for helper virus, and so they usually the standard in the field right now is to use genome copies so you would give a certain number of genome copies per kilogram would be the dose um, and the gold standard right now is droplet digital pcr to detect the genome copies that's that's how it's done okay got you yeah that is a nice talk dr dr cowling nice to meet you in person i mean virtually though <laughs> it's nice to meet you. Thank you. Uh, just uh, one question from my side. Uh, that was a wonderful uh, talk, Dr. Randy Cowley. Uh, just uh, so, is it that uh, we are still a long way to go for, uh, you know, cardiac specific expression of uh, uh, certain proteins uh, and uh, for clinical translation of uh, adeno associated virus mediated gene therapy? You know, I, I in terms of expression of proteins uh, in the cardiomyocyte, um, no, I mean we're here now, uh, and if if it's a if it's a straightforward single gene mutation, um, we're also here right now. So I mentioned the Dannon disease. So some of those, uh, uh, I know there is. Dr. Adler told me there's one patient who he received the uh, virus two years ago, and he is completely healthy now. Uh, and his brother, who didn't, had to have a, had a heart transplant. So as long as you can replace the dysfunctional protein, I, I think we're here. 
the, the, the issue is that most cardiac diseases, if you look at the general population, are far more complicated in terms of the etiology. And so, you know, in, in terms of genetic mutations and, the, and diseases, cardiovascular diseases, because of more simple genetic mutations, yeah, that, that, that's doable. But, uh, you know, if you just have atherosclerosis and you're generating, you know, ischemic cardiomyopathy because of that, you know, that's going to be a lot more difficult. So we're, we're well off from that. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions from the students who are in the convention center at the University of Kerala. So, but due to lack of time, maybe uh, we will not take more questions, but I'm sure they're going to contact uh, Dr. Kowling uh, about this and uh, that will be very, uh, lead to a lot of discussions probably. And uh, let me thank Dr. Kowling for uh, the wonderful talk and uh, educating all of us about the latest in the cardiovascular field about gene therapy. So thank you, Dr. Kowling, to take your time at this time of the night. And uh, thanks a lot and have a good night. Thank you, Dr. James. Thank I'm you. I'm going to hang around. I'm going to listen to Jason's talk a little Absolutely. bit. Then, yeah. <laughs> then I have to go pick up my son from the airport. <laughs> You're welcome for that. Yeah. Uh, I, I would hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Nitha, to go ahead with the program.